This is FAIR TV. I'm Janine Jackson. The NSA Edward Snowden story continues to surprise. We've seen the shocking move by British authorities to detain Guardian reporter Glenn Greenwald's partner at Heathrow Airport for nine hours, and the revelation that British intelligence pressured the Guardian to destroy computers in its offices. And some U.S. media outlets continue to confuse and mislead. On August 13th, CBS Evening News anchor Scott Pelley filed a curious update. In an interview today, Edward Snowden appears to describe himself as a spy. Snowden is the National Security Agency computer specialist who spilled some of America's top surveillance secrets. The New York Times asked Snowden about his collaboration with a reporter, and Snowden replied, as one might imagine, Normally, spies allergically avoid contact with reporters or media. Snowden, wanted by the United States, is being harbored by Russia. CBS is suggesting that Snowden made some kind of important admission with his use of the word spies. Couple that with Pelly's referencing the collaboration with an unnamed journalist, presumably Glenn Greenwald, and you get the picture. Snowden, now being harbored by Russia, was acting as a spy with a collaborator when he spilled those secrets. But a more plausible explanation for Snowden's comments is that he was referring to his work with the CIA and the National Security Agency. That's the meaning you get from the New York Times story that CBS is misconstruing for the sake of a cloak and daggers plot line that just happens to cast whistleblowers and journalists as traitorous criminals. Well, if things made sense in the media world, you wouldn't see very much from Weekly Standard editor Bill Kristol. That's because a guy who declared the battles of Afghanistan and Iraq decisively won in April 2003 just wouldn't have that much currency as a pundit. But we've got the world we've got, so Kristol, recently released from an exclusive contract with Fox, was there on ABC's This Week on August 18th talking about the New York Police Department's stop-and-frisk program, recently declared unconstitutional as what federal judge Shira Shendlin called a policy of indirect racial profiling. Crystal, not too surprisingly, wasn't having it. In 1990, there were 2,200 2, murders in New York. Last year, there were 414. We're not talking about a trivial accomplishment. The Giuliani Bloomberg accomplishment of cutting crime, radically cutting crime, way beyond what anyone thought was possible in New York has made possible the economic revitalization of New York and an awful lot of other good things, as well as saving a lot of lives. For many, of course, the fact that a practice is an unconstitutional violation of rights trumps the idea of whether or not it seems to work. But Crystal's data is also off base. He needs to start with the high murder rate in 1990, but it's irrelevant since stop and frisk didn't become policy till 2003, when that rate was already in steep decline. And Crystal also conveniently ignores that crime rates in cities that don't use such aggressive street stops have been declining even more steeply than New York City's. But invidious arguments based on misleading data seem to be what keep some people on the air rather than off it. Finally, Diane Sawyer sounded pretty decisive on ABC's World News August 9th. And now one more note out of Washington today. President Obama signed a compromise on student loans. The fractious debate over the law lowers interest rates for an estimated 11 million students, and it will save the average undergraduate $1,500 in interest this year alone. CBS Evening News joined in the celebration of the bill's passage, cheering the uncommonly bipartisan law that will keep loan rates around 3.9 percent. So why did Senator Bernie Sanders issue a press release headed, Student Loan Rates Rising? Because they are, in a way that these stories left unclear. What happened was a 2007 law lowered interest rates to 3.4 percent, but it expired. As of July 1st, because no new law had been passed, rates were going up to 6.8%. Now this new law sets these loans at 3.86% for the current year. But every year after, the interest rate on new loans will be tied to the rates set by Treasury. As this chart shows, the Congressional Budget Office projects that the new rates could be over 7%. 
One analysis suggests that five years from now, an undergraduate who took out the maximum in Stafford loans would most likely pay $4,700 more over the life of the loan than she would have last year, and $900 more than if Congress had done nothing and the 6.8 percent rate had simply stayed in place. But if media can tell a story about their beloved bipartisanship, you shouldn't expect details to get in the way. I'm Janine Jackson. This is Fair TV.